Hello everyone and welcome to the history of the Ottoman Empire. This is episode 0, Anatolia before the Ottomans. As with every other political entity, the Ottomans were the direct result of their immediate geopolitical circumstances. As we start our podcast in year 1280, Osman Bey, who would be later known as Osman I, became the leader of the Kaya tribe after the death of his father, Arturo. Osman's tribe had a couple hundred tents and was given lands in Seut, modern-day Blegic, Turkey, by the Seljuk Sultan. During the leadership of Arturo, Kaya tribe had fled from the Mongol invasions and migrated westwards. It is believed that the Kaya tribe was settled near the city of Merv in modern-day Turkmenistan. Following the Mongol invasions, Kaya tribe was driven westwards towards the Seljuk Sultanate in Anatolia. Seljuk Sultans at the time viewed these migrations as highly undesirable, despite being Turks themselves. By this age, Seljuk Sultans ruled over their settled subjects from their capital city in Konya, compared to the nomadic lifestyle of the Turkic migrants, who still lived in tents and grazed their sheep and horses rather than farming. From the Sultan's point of view, these nomads were highly undesirable. They did not pay taxes, did not join Sultan's army when called upon, and harassed the locals who actually paid taxes and contributed to the state. Thus, instead of letting these unruly nomads in freely, Seljuk Sultan tried to contain them. They were given lands at the frontiers of the state. In return, the nomads paid lip service to the Sultan, protected their own lands and were encouraged to raid enemy territory. This policy, in theory, would help secure Seljuk borders and create buffer zones between the Seljuk realm and its enemies. According to this policy, Sultan Keikubat I granted Arturo lands in Seut, near modern-day Bilecik, which was at the time right at the Byzantine-Seljuk border. Now that we have covered how Osman and his family got to Anatolia, we should also describe the state of the peninsula itself. Anatolia was historically controlled by the Eastern Roman Empire from 4th century up until 1071 without interruptions. In 1071, Eastern Romans were defeated in the Battle of Manzikert by the Seljuk Turks. After the Battle of Manzikert, Turks poured into Anatolia, drastically changing the political and ethnic landscape of the peninsula. Turkic tribes poured into Anatolia, depopulating many of the local towns and villages, and permanently moved in. This first wave of Turkic invasions were followed by a second one in 13th century. Mongols drove hundreds of thousands of Turkic tribesmen from Central Asia and Iran to modern-day Anatolia. As we set the stage for the founding of the Ottoman state in late 13th century, Anatolia is dominated by the Turkic tribes driven west by the Mongols. Visualizing the map of Anatolia as a horizontal rectangle on the northwest or top left, we have the waning Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantine Empire, as it would later be called, was devastated during the Fourth Crusade when a Latin coalition took its capital, Constantinople, in 1204 and sacked it. This was followed by a 60-year-long devastating war between Byzantine pretenders, Latins, and Bulgarians. Emperor Michael Palaiologos emerged victorious eventually and retook Constantinople, restoring the empire. However, the damage was done, the empire was devastated, its manpower spent, treasury bankrupted, and its capital destroyed. On the other side of the border, to the east of Anatolia, reigned the Seljuk Sultans of Rum, 
Once great and proud rulers of Konya were reduced to a rump state following the Mongol invasions. Mongol armies defeated the Seljuks in the Battle of Köseda in 1242. Following this battle, Seljuks became vassals of the Mongols. The Mongols mainly pursued a policy of destabilization in the Seljuk Sultanate. The Mongol Ilkhans, who nominally ruled over the Seljuks from Iran, interfered with the affairs of Seljuks constantly. In 1260s, three brothers, Kılıçdaroğlu IV, Kekubat II, and Kekos II, fought a devastating civil war. This civil war was made increasingly devastating by the Mongol interference. The Mongols supported the weaker brother to prolong the conflict as much as possible and made sure that the weakest candidate became the sultan of the weakest possible Seljuk Sultanate. At the end, Keikos II was defeated by the Mongols and died in exile. Keikubat II was found dead mysteriously on his way to meet the Mongol Khan in Iran. And Kılıçdaroğlu was killed by his second in command, a man called Perwane. Following the regicide of Kılıçdaroğlu, Perwane crowned the three year old Keikos III and ruled as the regent with Mongol support. As all this infighting weakened the sultans of Konya, the Anatolian peninsula was constantly getting filled with those that wanted to take advantage of this weakness. Historians usually underplay the effects of the Turkic migration to Anatolia following the Mongol invasions. It is usually thought that Anatolia was Turkified following Manzikert, but most of the Turks actually migrated to Anatolia following the Mongol invasions. Out of the 12 Turkish states that appeared after the Seljuk collapse, seven of them were founded by Turkic tribes that migrated to Anatolia after the Mongol invasions. Even though we do not have solid numbers of these migrations, due to the lack of records among the nomads, the power obtained by the new immigrants show that they were just as numerous as the Turks that migrated after Manzikert, if not more. This demographic shift would come to overshadow all other political events of 13th century Anatolia in my opinion. All of a sudden, the area was swarmed with hundreds of thousands of nomadic Turkic tribesmen and there were no central authority anywhere on the peninsula to contain them. These migrants later would be the manpower base of the Ottoman Empire in the next centuries allowing the Ottoman sultans to gather armies that have never been seen before in the region. But that is a topic for the later episodes. Now, following the initial Turkish invasion of Anatolia, Byzantine Empire and Turks maintained an uneasy status quo in the peninsula. And the status quo was mainly caused by geographical differences between Byzantine and Turkish Anatolias. Once again, let's visualize Anatolia, thinking it as a horizontal rectangle. To north, by the Black Sea shore, Pandic Mountains rose parallel to the sea. This area was and is very humid and rainy, with a climate that is similar to that of the United Kingdom. To the south, Taurus Mountains lie, protecting the coasts from invasions. The western shore is also covered with mountains, however the mountains here lie perpendicular to the shore, allowing some access between inner Anatolia and the Aegean coast. These areas have a climate similar to modern day Greece. And lastly there was the central Anatolian steppe, isolated from the coast by mountains. The terrain here is made mostly of flat plateaus, the area is very dry as the mountains block the humidity from the seas on three sides. As a result, the climate here is semi-arid and the area is covered with grasslands, very similar to the steppes of Central Asia and Mongolia, the homelands of these Turkic nomads. In conclusion, geographically there were two different Anatolias, the fertile and rich coastline and the arid steppe in the center. 
This geographical divide determined the political status quo between the Turks and the Byzantine Empire for 200 years between the years 1070 and 1250. In this period, Turks were able to settle in central Anatolia, which had a terrain and climate similar to their homeland in Central Asia. Meanwhile, the Byzantines retained their control in the coasts with the help of mountain ranges and climate that was hostile to nomadic lifestyle. The nomads required vast steps to graze their horses and sheep, and these mountainous coastlines did not have these. We see a change in the status quo after the 1250s. The Byzantines were concerned with their civil war and then threats from the west. They were also bankrupt and very short on manpower. This, combined with the unstoppable influx of nomads, shattered the Byzantine front in Asia. By 1280, when Osman I, the founder of the Ottoman state, became the leader of his tribe, Byzantines had lost the northern, western and southern Anatolian coastlines to Turkic conquests. These conquests were not in the form of an organized effort, but an unorganized migration by the nomadic tribes. In the absence of a central authority to oppose them, these tribes swarmed the Byzantine countryside, raiding and pillaging these areas, which resulted in the exodus of local Byzantine populace, who were replaced with Turks. Eventually major urban centers, cut off from the rest of the empire, fell too, in the absence of any reinforcements from the capital. Except for cities that were well fortified and could be supplied through the sea, such as Smyrna on the western coast and Trebizond in the northeastern coast. During Emperor Andronikos II's reign, several armies were dispatched to stop Turkish aggressions. However, the Turks avoided fighting these armies head on and waited for the Byzantines to turn back to Constantinople. When the imperial troops turned back to Europe, the Turks would reappear from the steppe and continue as usual, unopposed. These Byzantine expeditions control reached only as far as the Byzantine armies marched and then left the area with them. The crown of Constantinople in this period simply could not afford to fight an expensive and long war in Anatolia against endless waves of Turks. The socio-economic tide had changed. In 1280, on the date of Osman Bey's coronation, the entire peninsula, except for the coastline of Marmara Sea, or the northwestern corner of the area was ruled by these Turkish beyliks in practice. Now, all of these beyliks paid lip service to the Seljuk Sultan in Konya, however by 1280 the Seljuk Sultan barely controlled his capital, let alone anything else. This was the political situation in Anatolia itself a weakening Byzantine Empire and Seljuk Sultanate, and a dozen small Turkish polities, fueled by a constant nomadic migration from the east. But what about the other major powers neighboring Anatolia that might use this opportunity to expand into the region? There were two that are worth mentioning, the Ilkhanate to the east and the Mamluks to the south. Ilkhanate was a Mongol successor state ruled by the descendants of Genghis Khan himself. Ilkhans ruled Iran, Iraq and eastern Anatolia from their capital in Tabriz. Once a superpower, the Ilkhanate by late 13th century was swiftly disintegrating. The Khanate spent most of its resources in civil wars and wars with the Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt over the control of Syria. Overall, it lacked the political unity to wield any further power in Anatolia. To south, the Mamluk Sultanate was fairly powerful and rich. It was a large sultanate that ruled over Egypt and Levant, and had access to one of the best militaries in the world at the time. However, logistics prevented the Mamluks from expanding into Anatolia. In 1277, Mamluk Sultan invaded Anatolia, and crushed the Mongol army in the Battle of Elbistan. However, after his victory, he found a hostile area filled with unruly nomads 
and problematic logistics. At the end, he was forced to retreat back to Syria, despite his triumph. Overall, the Mamluk Sultanate was extremely powerful, but was unable to expand into Anatolia due to its conflicts with the Mongols, Crusaders, and logistical problems. All in all, Anatolia at the time was having a power vacuum. Filled with collapsing powers and weak neighbors, it was a warlord's dream. The entire region was a prize waiting to be won. The warlord that had the best skills could dominate the area without much difficulty and unite hundreds of thousands of nomads under his banner. It was a very rare moment in history where every small warlord had a real opportunity of carrying out an empire for himself. Thank you for listening. If you have liked it, please subscribe and we will see you on the next episode where we will talk about the first years of Osman's Sultanate.